So, first of all, I would like to welcome you to this webinar this evening, you, the participants and the faculty. The topic today is on the involvement of personalized pharmacological treatment for BPH LUTs. And without any further delay, I would like to introduce to you the faculty that is with us this evening. It's Malte Rieken from Zürich, it's Matthias Oerke from Gronau, and it's Paolo Coppacrosso, not from Milan, but from Varese. And each of those presenters will cover several aspects on this, what I believe, quite interesting topic. The schedule is as follows. We have 15 minutes per presenter. We will not have a discussion, discussion between the talks, but at the end of the talks, we will have a discussion for 10, 15 minutes. And the web webinar is accredited with one CMA points. I would like to emphasize that this activity is supported by an educational grant of GSK. And in doing so, I would like to ask now Malte Rieken from Zürich to give us some ideas on what are the most re re robust response predictors of pharmacological treatment and update on the available evidence. Malte, please, the virtual floor is yours. So with some delay, I also like to welcome you to this webinar. And uh, my name is Malte Rieken. I'm a urologist from Switzerland. And I want to talk to you about what are the most robust uh, response predictors of pharmacological treatment. And this is actually an update on the available evidence. And uh, so this is my disclosures. And first of all, I want to go into the question, why do we need predictors of response of pharmacological treatment? We know that pharmacological treatment is actually the mainstay of a blood treatment. However, it is crucial that we try to individualize our treatment. And that's the reason why predictors of response are helpful in tailoring the treatment we are approaching with our patients. Then, of course, the question is, what kind of predictors are available? And I want to go through some of these, like intravesical prosthetic protrusion, age, IPSS, QMAX, prostate volume, PSA, and PVR. And in the end, I want to provide some summary. So what about intravesical prosthetic protrusion? This is something we can easily measure ourselves with the ultrasound. And several studies were able to show that intravesical prosthetic protrusion is a nice non-invasive parameter to estimate obstruction. Of course, pressure flow studies, urinamics are better, but still it's kind of helpful. And what studies could show, for example, related to pharmacological treatment is that an intravesical prosthetic protrusion more than 10 millimeter is associated with a successful trial without catheter under alpha blocker after urinary retention. So if you have an IPP lower than 10, then the chances are around 80% as compared to a higher intravesical prosthetic protrusion. And on the other hand, it's also a nice parameter for the response to alpha blocker treatment. For example, in this scale, you can see from a study which has been published a couple of years ago that related to IPP, the response to treatment to tamsulosin can be variable, which means that those who are responding have a lower IPP, while those who are not responding have an IPP of 10 or more millimeters. So IPP indeed one of the well-known parameters. Then I want to move on to the combination of parameters, which are baseline variables. So there have been several studies showing that baseline variables have an impact on progression and response to treatment. And if you look at the timeline, we know that the Olmstead County study, it's an old study involving various parameters, could show that acute urinary retention and also large surgery are strongly related to baseline variables such as age, severity of LUTs, low QMAX, increased PVR, and high PSA. Then additional evidence was provided by the PLES study, which is a study comparing finasteride and uh, placebo, and it could also show 
that a baseline PSA, for example, of more than 1.5 nanogram per milliliter is a predictor of long-term change in LUTs and flow rate. In addition, we have the famous NPOP study. I don't want to go into the detail, but here again, baseline parameters such as frosted volume, PSA, QMAX, and PBR are predictors of a greater risk of BPH clinical progression, usually defined as a composite endpoint of various parameters. In addition, we have data from the ALTERS trial, which also could show that there is a higher risk of deterioration of IPSS, acute urinary tension or surgery if the PVR is higher and also the prostate volume is higher. And in addition, we have data from the COMBAT study, also well-known and well-described data, which once again could confirm that baseline parameters are predictors of response to medical treatment in patients who are undergoing treatment for their LUTs. But the question is, if we look at study data, and these are data from the COMBAT study, what can they tell us? For example, let's pick one point. Let's take this study point, which is a patient taking the combination, dutasteride and tamsulosin, at 24 months. And the question is, what information is provided by these data? And if you look at it, it shows up that the adjusted mean change from baseline is minus 6.2 in this specific combination arm. And the average baseline characteristics of all patients included in the study in this arm are age around 66, IPSC 16.6, .6, PBR 54, and so on and so on. However, usually our individual patients, they are not exactly the mean of the inclusion criteria of those studies. And that's actually the challenge so in the end, we have those mean change from baseline per patient with the mean baseline characteristics, but the study data, they cannot tell us what kind of information on treatment response is related to individual baseline factors. For example, if you have someone who's taking the combination treatment, but his uh, PVR, for example, is higher than the mean PVR in the study, how does this individual patient then respond to the combination treatment? And in this context, study data have clear limitations. Based on these study data, several authors were looking into predictive modeling studies in BPO and LUTs. And what the authors were looking at are various baseline parameters related to the prediction of outcomes. So in this busy slide, let's start, for example, here with the 2006 Slavin study. So what we can see, the, page, the, the authors were taking as a data source, the dodosterite data from a phase uh, three trial. They have a quite huge sample size, and they were looking at the prediction of acute urinary retention in men treated with the placebo or dodosterite. And what the authors could see that study parameters associated with the prediction of this outcome risk are, for example, IPSS, prostate volume, PSA, QMAX. Then looking at some other studies, for example, the risk of surgical intervention, which is, for example, an observational study. Also here, we can see once again that IPSS, prostate volume, PSA, and QMAX at baseline are strong predictors of surgical intervention. And for example, the latest study, which I will show you in a second, also combined study data from several studies and was also looking at various baseline data as predictors for response of medical treatment. So if we go further into the topic and if we look at so-called multivariable prediction models, it means that we take various baseline parameters into equation, and we try to individually predict whether the patient and to which, which kind of degree the patient is able to respond to a certain kind of medical treatment. And in this recently published uh, study, the authors were developing a predictive model to project the effect of placebo tamsulosine, dutasteride, and the combination of tamsulosine and dutasteride on change in IPSS from baseline 
as well as cumulative incidence of acute urinary retention and BPH-related surgery up to 48 months. And this actually are models which include baseline characteristics, which define patient risk of disease progression as predictors. So something where you look at individual data to predict outcomes. What kind of studies were put into the, uh, into the analysis? So the authors, they included data from 9,167 patients. And these data were from the COMBAT study, so the well-known combination study of tamsulucin and dutasteride, as well as three phase three dutasteride monotherapy studies. And here you can see the details of those studies, which I don't want to go into precisely. However, you can see that it's a huge cohort of patients where the authors were looking at. And this is the outcome of, a, or these are the parameters which we're taking into the equation of a multivariable prediction model related to IPSS. And if you look at the very relevant covariates, we can see that the IPSS baseline time, the kind of treatment, and once again, time in months as an interactive term, were the most relevant parameters when predicting the IPSS as relevant outcome parameter. What about the risk of acute urinary retention or surgery? Here we can see that various covariates have an impact on outcomes, while for the IPSS, only a couple of them were, rele were relevant. Here we have much more like treatment, baseline prostate volume, baseline uh, QMAX, baseline uh, residual volume, PSA, age at treatment start, baseline PSA, as well as alpha blocker taken in the last 12 months. So these are all parameters which were then put into the model to see how they can predict an individual response. So what, if you put all those data together, what happens? What kind of prediction system can we have? So on the one hand, we can have very complex tables on the left-hand side. Or, for example, we can end up with a nomogram. Nomograms we know very well from uh, oncologic topics. However, in this context, it is clear that the table is something which is not very user-friendly. Everybody can appreciate it looks very complex. And also, a nomogram is sometimes not that easy to use, especially if we would need four different nomograms because we need one for placebo, one for the alpha blocker, one for the 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, and one for the combination. And so the authors, they were able to develop an online prediction model, which is an online tool. And with this one, you very easily can put in the parameters of your patient. So these are the baseline parameters. And then the system automatically, on the one hand, shows you the estimated IPSS trajectory, as well as the estimated risk of acute urinary retention or BPH-related surgery, depending on treatment arm. So this is an online tool. This is an online model where you actually can visualize the estimated response to tamsulucin, to testeride combination, or placebo, which means no treatment, for any individual profile having any possible combination of covariates. The caveat is that this Currently, this model is not, uh, has not been approved for clinical use. However, I think it's something we can really look forward to using because it is something which is helpful in counseling our patients. So here we have this BPH tool, which can really help us in individually predicting treatment response. To summarize, we can say that various response predictors of medical treatment have been described. However, a post hoc analysis of larger studies often seems to be insufficient to describe the complex interaction between various parameters. Multivariable models, such as the one I was showing you, seem to most appropriately reflect clinical reality because most of our patients don't fall into the mean inclusion criteria of the studies. In addition, the multivariable models that reflect the interaction of parameters, which also reflects the clinical reality in our patients. And if you want to look 
at the future, I think it's still important that future studies should analyze the utility of these models on outcomes as well as on clinical decision making. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Well, great. Thanks a lot for, for the presentation. It's actually quite a long history from the initial identification of some markers to this online tool. And I think it was a great presentation. And as I said, by the end of the talk, we will have a, a common discussion of all three talks. And I would like to invite all the attendees to use the Q&A um, um, feature on the, on the screen to send us some questions. And without any further delay, I would like to hand over now to Matthias Oelker from, Han from Hanover, Grona actually, to give us some his ideas on the more, most recent data on how to do a decent diagnostic workup in these patients. Matthias, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, Stefan, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can see my slide presentation. I can see it on my screen. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. OK, thank you very much for the feedback. And you can hear me, right? We can hear you fine. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. So I can start my presentation. So when we want to use the models that Professor Rieken just told you, we need some baseline parameters. And he has mentioned some of those. And I would like to guide you through the EAU guidelines. And I will show you that these baseline parameters are much needed and are also recommended in all patients. So we don't use abnormal parameters to put it in the prediction model, to, to, to put it in the BPH tool. This is real data, which we daily assess in these patients. I have some conf potential conflicts of interest, but my presentation was completely independent on these associations with the other pharma companies. So when we have to assess a patient, we like to use the EU guidelines on non-neutralic male LUTs. And you can see uh, the image of the guidelines on the left side. And currently, the chair is Stavros Kravas, a good friend of mine from Greece. So we want to um, assess the patient. And the tests which we use are useful for the diagnosis, but also for the monitoring, assessing the risk of disease progression, but also the treatment planning and the prediction of the treatment outcome. So when we have a patient, an individualized patient with LUTs, we aim to do two things, to identify the diagnosis, that's male LUTs, LUTs BPH, but also differentiate this diagnosis from differential diagnosis from other diseases. The second aim is to define the individual clinical profile, including the risk of disease progression in men with male LUTs in order to provide appropriate most modern care. Let's have a close look to disease progression. BPH in general is a progressive disease that includes worsening of symptoms and disease-specific quality of life, deterioration of urine flow, for example, Qmax, and also increase in prostate volume. What can happen is acute urinary retention and BPH-related surgery, but we must not forget other complications like bladder stones, recurrent urinary tract infections, urinary incontinence, renal insufficiency, and other types of bladder dysfunction. So we always have to keep in mind that BPH or the patient in front of us with BPH LUTs may progress over time. So what are the risk factors? And Professor Rieken has already mentioned those. In all studies, in epidemiological studies, but also in trials, we always have the same risk factors. They're always the same. It's advanced age, symptom severity, decreased urine flow, elevated prostate volume, increased PSA concentration, and increased post-void residual urine. However, the threshold values for stronger disease progression or lower disease progression vary within the epidemiological trial or the study. And I'm showing you here the, the clinical trial data of the, of the MTOP study, where 737 were treated with placebo and were followed up four and a half years. And again, the same risk factors, older age, and in this case was 62 years above. Higher PSA, 
more than 1.6 nanogram per milliliter, higher prostate volume, 31 cubic centimeters, lower QMAX, 10.6, higher IPSS, more than 17, and higher PVR. These are the mean values of the entire study population. So that doesn't mean that everybody older than 62 has an increased risk of disease progression, but the combination of these, of these factors with the different thresholds make this a risk factor. When you see here on the, on the right side, you can see that the big majority of these patients who were treated with placebo had a symptomatic progression. That means an IPSS increase of four points or more. Some people had a clinical progression. That means, for example, renal insufficiency, urinary tract infections, um, bladder stones, and so on. And 12% of the study population of the MTOP study had a urinary retention. But these risk factors and these chances of risk, disease risk progression may vary between the different studies. So what have, do we have to do? Let's be easy and just take the EAU guidelines on male LUTs, and you will see the assessment algorithm on the left side. And you can see easily, and I'm enlarging a little bit, what are the key parameters to evaluate the patient. It's the history, symptom uh, score questionnaire, urinalysis, physical examination, also with digital rectal examination, PSA concentration, and post voicegital urine and also, in some cases, frequency volume charts. These are the recommendations based on the evidence that's published in the latest EU guidelines on male LUTs. But given the complex etiology of LUTs, a proper evaluation is a key to adequately guide the management. So we have to evaluate all these parameters in each individual patient. In many cases, the urologist is the only or the major treating physician, so therefore we have to differentiate this male LUT from other diseases. We increasingly know more about the recommendations that can benefit a patient considering their individual characteristics. So it's now going to individualized medicine because we have to determine all the risk factors and all the thresholds in these individual patients. And as you certainly know, the era of one size fits all is over, especially when you look into the treatment. Not everybody is fit or suitable for an alpha blocker only. First thing is how to assess LUTs, lower urinary tract symptoms, tract symptoms. Two possible ways, the history and or questionnaires. And by both of these tools, you can evaluate, is it a patient with only or predominant storage symptoms? Is it only voiding or predominant voiding symptoms or are these post victorian symptoms? Just pick the storage symptoms. When you have a patient with urgency, frequency, nocturia and urgency incontinence, and if he all has these characteristics, we would classify this patient as an overactive bladder patient. And I think you agree. But the big majority of male lux patients have a varying amount of voiding symptoms, storage symptoms, and also post victorian symptoms. And we have to be aware that all the symptoms are unspecific. They do not only originate from the prostate, but they might originate from the bladder, prostate, urethra, pelvic floor, from the nervous system, from the ureter, and from the bowel. So it's sometimes it's hard to differentiate where the symptoms come from, but we can gross separate this patient as storage patient, voiding patients, post micturation patients, or the combination. So unless Understanding the patient habits and existing comorbidity will help to drive individual recommendations. So we have to know what is the patient, what does the patient, what problem has the patient, and how, how big is the problem. A self-completed validated symptom questionnaire should be obtained to objectify and quantify LUTs. I will show you one later. Bladder diaries are sometimes useful, especially when we evaluate nocturia and or storage symptoms. And sexual function should also be evaluated, and we should use then the International Index of Erectile Function. This is the most prominent and the most popular questionnaire. We know the importance of our medical history, but it's often unrealistic, especially in private practice, to complete two, three, four, five questionnaires. So the most of the evidence that we obtain from the patient originates from the talk of the doctor or neurologist with the patient. In the EU guidelines, it's recommended to use symptom questionnaires 
specially validated symptom questionnaires. And the most popular, the most known one is the International Prostate Symptom Score, the IPSS. This is a questionnaire which you can see on the left side. We have seven symptoms questions and one quality of life question. Each symptom question you can answer with zero to five, making an overall count between zero to 35. So you should use symptom questionnaire in all patients. We should use the IPSS questionnaire, not only because it's always recommended in the guidelines, but it has always been used in clinical trials. It has a recall period of four weeks. Taken together, the count of the first seven questions, we can have an overall count of zero. There are no LUTs. Mild LUTs are, is a count between one and seven, moderate LUTs eight to 19, and severe LUTs 20 to 35. We can quantify storage, voiding, and the combination with a questionnaire, so we can gross classify the patient. And what we know is that the LUTs severity goes along with the quality of life. And what you know is a treatment recommendation, an active treatment recommendation, is if you have a quality of life of three or more. So what does the EAU guideline tell you? The recommendation is take a complete medical history for men with LUTs. Strong recommendation. So take a history. It's not based on much evidence, but it's a general a recommendation for every patient. What is said about the questionnaires? Questionnaires are sensitive to symptom changes. Symptom scores can quantify LUTs and identify which type of symptoms are predominant. This is just what I told you. However, these questionnaires, especially the IPSS, is not disease specific. So it's not a BPH only questionnaire. It's gender unspecific. Same um, um, women and men in the same age group have the same IPSS scores. So it's not male specific and it's not age specific. But it's recommended to use validated symptom score questionnaires, including BADA and quality of life during the assessment of male LUTs and for the re-evaluation during and, uh, and, and after treatment. Strong recommendation. So it should also be added by diaries, and it says use bladder diaries to assess male LUTs with a predominant storage component or nocturia, and tell the patient to complete a diary of three days or even longer. Electronic diaries might be more beneficial, but there has been no validated electronic diary on the market. It's only a research tool until now because it's a medical product and it's very expensive to validate these um, electronic diaries. Digital rectal examination of the prostate can be done by, uh, or determination of prostate volume can be done by digital rectal examination or by transrectal ultrasound. And what we know, the rectal examination is the simplest and easiest way to determine prostate volume, but truss measurement, as you can see on the right side, is more accurate. There's an underestimation of prostate volume by digital rectal examination uh, with increasing truss volume. The bigger the prostate is, the more we underestimate it with the finger tip examination. And there are, there are models that use visual aids, and I will show you some of those now. The importance of the individual prostate volume, because prostate volume is a, is a strong predictor of disease progression. You can see the results of the MTOP study, and you can see the results of the 737 patients assigned to placebo. And when we take the mean value of the prostate volume, that was 31 cubic um, centimeters or milliliters, you can see disease progression. That's the incidence of clinical progression is significantly different for patients with a higher prostate volume. And the same is true for overall progression, IPSS increase, acute urinary tension, and invasive therapy. So it indicates that somebody with an increased, post, uh, increased prostate volume has an increased risk of disease progression. And this is what you can see, probability of BPH progression with a big prostate volume or smaller prostate volume, you see significant differences according to the baseline parameter. So what does the EU guideline tell you? Perform a, a physical examination, including digital rectal examination in the assessment of male LUT. It's a strong recommendation. And some, let's say, unexperienced urologists or GPs or, or, or other specialty groups cannot judge the prostate site. And we can give them a visual aid. And you can see here 
to two examples that's a golf ball and the golf ball has an has a volume of about uh, 40 cubic centimeters and if you take take a ping pong ball it's also increased it's bigger than normal prostate is at 33 or 34 cubic centimeters so this is just a rough estimation to determine prostate size if you have an example like the golf ball or the ping pong ball next thing we have to take is a psa measurement and psa is a it's a glycoprotein specific for men and also the prostate and we use it for exclusion of prostate cancer for estimation of prostate size and also for the judgment of bph progression for example prostate growth symptom deterioration risk of acute urinary tension and need for surgery you can also see again for the mtop study and here in the PLES study that was finasteride against placebo that people with an higher PSA value or lower PSA value, they have a different overall progression. Overall progression is significantly higher with a higher PSA, but also a symptomatic progression, acute urinary tension in the major therapy. So it tells you that an enlarged and increased PSA value will give you a like significant disadvantages in the clinical um, in the clinical course. The same is true for the PLES study, where they divided in the lower third, 0 to 1.3 nanogram per, per milliliter, 1.4 to 3.2, 3.3 .3 to 12.0. And you can see somebody with a lower PSA concentration or maybe a lower prostate volume will decrease in symptoms over time, whereas the patients with the higher PSL values or the higher prostate volumes do not benefit from, uh, uh, from the treatment and will deteriorate alone without any further treatment. So what does the EAU guideline tell you? You should measure PSA. The diagnosis of prostate cancer will change management. It's clear it's a differential diagnosis to prostate cancer, but also measure PSA if it assists the treatment and or the decision-making process. And then we go to disease progression, and then it's important again. And this is true for even relatively low PSA levels, like 1.4 nanograms and sometimes 1.6 nanogram per milliliter. Then urophlometry. Urophlometry can detect in general voiding disorders. The key parameter is the maximum urine flow, which you can see that's the highest flow here uh, when you record it as a graph. Repeat the, the urophlometry if you have abnormal values, that's self-speaking, and the low Qmax can be caused by bladder outlet obstruction and or the chooser under activity, but you can only determine voiding dysfunction, but you cannot determine if it's bladder outlet obstruction or the chooser under activity. What does the EAU guideline tell you? Perform urophlometry in the initial assessment of male LUTs, a weak recommendation and perform urophilometry prior to any medical or invasive treatment as a baseline parameter, and that is a strong recommendation. The last parameter I would like to tell you or introduce you is post voyager digital urine. You can do it either by ultrasound or by catheterization, and I think we everybody does it of you by, by ultrasound measurement, as you can see on the left side. It's a well-known factor of disease progression, and if you see the MTOP study again, you have the higher values, the threshold again is 39 milliliters. And if you have 39 milliliters or more, then you have a higher chance of disease progression compared to lower uh, PVR volume. A large PVA may indicate a poor response to treatment, especially watchful waiting. It's a key measurement for patients uh, using antimuscarinics because if you have a high PVR, then uh, you are likely to produce acute urinary tension if you use antimuscarinics. And there's no PVR threshold for the treatment decision. This is a research priority. And again, this is a medium value, but this is not always in every study the exact threshold value. So what does the EAU guideline tell you? You should measure PVR in the assessment of male LUTs. It's a weak recommendation, but it's still uh, recommended. My last slide, and this is also the summary, we should do a careful assessment of men with LUTs, and this is valuable to diagnose and quantify male LUTs. This is important to separate male LUTs from other diseases, and also to identify people with a risk of disease progression. In order to do so, we can use the recommendation of the EAU guidelines on male LUTs, 
And all the baseline investigations which are recommended, and I've just mentioned to you, uh, are used in the BPH tool. And I'm showing you on the right side the parameters which you can change online. It's age, IPSS, process volume, PVR, QMAX, PSA, and previous alpha blocker use. And these are the parameters which you can use for individualized uh, outcome measurements. Uh, you can convict the individual change and the individual risk of disease progression with patients showing here different baseline parameters. So I'm done with my presentation. I would like to thank you very much and I'm open for discussions later. Well, also from my side, thanks a lot for giving us this overview and this in-depth view on the EAU guidelines and to emphasizing the role of these guidelines and how necessary it is to follow those. Thanks a lot. And I will hand over directly to Paolo Coppogrosso from Varese to give, his, to give us our, uh, his ideas on the evolution of individualized pharmacological treatment, some key highlights. Paolo, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you, Professor, for the, for the introduction. Uh, I'm glad to be part of this uh, tremendous faculty. So I think you should now see my presentation. Uh, so my talk will be uh, mainly focused on the key evidence of the evolution of, of the individualized pharmacological uh, treatment in BPH blood patients. I have no conflict of interest. So first of all, uh, why we need to tailor the treatment for BPH labs according to patient's profile. Uh, the first thing is to optimize treatment efficacy and reduce the risk of disease progression. And the second important thing is to reduce the risk of treatment-related adverse events. These are the clinical variables that should drive the BPH personalized treatment in these patients. So first of all, comorbidities, cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, obesity, then prostate volume, of course, symptoms, storage or voiding, prostatic inflammation, and sexual function. So one of the first important step uh, in the history for uh, uh, treatment of BPH last, uh, LATS was the advent of uroselective alpha blockers, uh, which uh, were drug uh, able to be very selective for the uh, urogenital tract. And uh, uh, this, uh, um, this important feature was uh, uh, able to reduce uh, the risk of uh, vascular, car cardiovascular uh, uh, adverse events because of a lower effect on the vascular district as compared to the uh, former doxadosin and tradosin that were, using, uh, were used uh, before. So as you can see in these uh, um, studies from the early 2000s, uh, uroselective drugs such as uh, uh, tamsulosin and alfuzosin were uh, uh, less commonly associated with uh, uh, episodes of symptomatic hypotension and uh, uh, also with the uh, uh, lower risk of uh, dizziness, which is another important uh, adverse event that can be uh, due to uh, vascular dilatation, systemic vascular dilatation. And for uh, uh, these reasons, uh, also uh, treatment with tamsulosin has been shown to be safe in patients who are taking concomitant medication for uh, uh, arterial hypertension since uh, uh, there were very uh, few cases of uh, blood pressure reductions uh, during concomitant treatment. Uh, therefore, the EAU guidelines suggest to use uh, uroselective drugs such as alfuzosin and tamsulosin in patients with cardiovascular comorbidities uh, and or vasoactive uh, co-medication. Moving forward, also metabolic syndrome, uh, as you know, has been largely associated with the BPH and uh, lower urinary tract symptoms. Uh, and uh, along with the metabolic syndrome, most of the patients may have hypogonadism. And there are several data showing that uh, hypogonadism is associated with uh, worse symptoms. And that uh, there are data showing that the treatment of hypogonadism with uh, testosterone replacement therapy is associated with a significant improvements in urinary symptoms and sexual function. And for this reason, this is something that should be considered in patients with uh, uh, hypogonadism and BPH. Moving forward to prostate volume, we have already uh, listened a lot about prostate volume uh, by the previous speakers. Uh, 
uh, we know that finasteride and dutasteride uh, had shown in randomized clinical trial uh, their uh, effect in reducing the risk of uh, acute urinary tension and need for BPH uh, surgery. And uh, after the advent of uh, the uh, milestone studies, like such as the MTOP study combination therapy, showing that combination of uh, uh, finasteride and the doxazosine, doxazosine was uh, uh, better than placebo in reducing the risk of clinical progression. And also the COMBAT trial showing that the tamsulosine and dutasteride was more effective in combination as compared to uh, single treatment in reducing the risk of clinical progression. But uh, we, have to, uh, uh, we have to focus on the inclusion criteria of this study since these studies uh, uh, mainly include uh, men with an IPSS score uh, higher than 12, so patients with uh, moderate severe symptoms, a PSA higher than 1.5, and a prostate volume higher than 30. So all these uh, effects should be considered according to this inclusion criteria. And indeed, the sub-analysis of the GOMBAT trial showed that uh, the effect of combination therapy was uh, extremely significant, especially in patients with a prostate volume higher than uh, 40 milliliters. And for this reason, this is the threshold that also the EAU guidelines considered uh, <clears throat> consider to, to be used for um, suggesting a combination treatment with uh, alpha blockers uh, and 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. Uh, moving forward, storage symptoms is another important factor to consider, uh, since um, many men with BPH and LATS may be bothered by significant storage symptoms, uh, along with uh, uh, voiding symptoms. And in these patients, uh, the, the treatment with uh, uh, anti-muscarinic drugs could be uh, significant in reducing, uh, uh, in improving their quality of life. And uh, therefore, this is something that should be considered also in association with uh, um, alpha blockers, since it has been de demonstrated that uh, it is superior than uh, single treatment alone. Then prostatic inflammation, as uh, most of you already know, prostatic inflammation is something that uh, uh, is uh, always uh, almost always present in, public, in patients with BPH. These are the, the findings from the reduced trial where patients have been uh, um, have been biopsied for uh, uh, for the BPH and uh, and IPSA, and they showed that in seventy seven percent of cases there was chronic inflammation, and that chronic inflammation was associated with worse urinary tract symptoms. And uh, even uh, um, more interesting, uh, in the MTOMS study, in the sub-analysis of the MTOMS study, uh, looking at uh, prostate biopsy markers of inflammation, these markers were significantly higher in patients with a higher risk of clinical progression. So uh, severe inflammation is a very important factor to consider. And we know that uh, in this kind of patients, there are meta-analysis of randomized trials showing that uh, the combination therapy of the, the exanic extract of serenoarifens uh, uh, along with the alpha blocker could be more effective than monotherapy in improving the lower urinary tract symptoms. Finally, sexual function. Uh, we know that uh, rectal dysfunction and uh, LATS uh, most, more frequently are, are very frequently associated in these patients. And uh, uh, the risk of erectile dysfunction increased with the increase of uh, symptom severity. Uh, we know also that uh, PDA5 inhibitors have proved in several randomized clinical trials to be effective in improving uh, LATS and uh, erectile function, and especially uh, Tadalafil 5 milligram uh, daily. So this is, uh, uh, again, something that uh, should be considered, especially in patients suffering both from erectile dysfunction and moderate to severe lower urinary tract symptoms. And this is important because when looking, uh, as shown in this systematic review, when look looking at uh, patients' uh, values and expectations and preferences regarding uh, treatment of uh, BPH LATS, they um, stated that avoiding sexual side effects is something very important to be considered where, uh, when prescribing a pharmacological treatment. Uh, we have to know that because we know that uh, several uh, 
uh, drugs uh, in this case are associated with uh, uh, a negative impact on sexual function, especially alpha blockers. Uh, we know that can cause a detriment, can have a, a detrimental effect on ejaculation with an ejaculation or retrograde ejaculation. Uh, and this is something that uh, it is uh, less common with the non-selective compounds, uh, doxazosin and uh, terazosin. Uh, moreover, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors have been also associated with a significant risk of hypoactive sexual desire and erectile dysfunction uh, um, in, uh, in, in uh, several randomized clinical trials uh, without any difference between uh, the two drugs. Uh, and uh, even more important, the combination of 5 alpha reductase inhibitors along with alpha blockers could be associated with a, a greater um, risk of uh, sexual side effects as compared to monotherapy alone. So in conclusions, uh, we know uh, also, uh, as we have listened from previous uh, uh, from the previous presentations, that we have to consider several preoperative uh, factors when deciding which kind uh, preoperative sorry, baseline factor when deciding which kind of, uh, of treatment to suggest to our patients. And uh, basically, I think that uh, the main thing that we should focus on are, of course, prostate volume and, uh, and uh, all the other clinical uh, um, uh, factors that have been highlighted before, but also to consider sexual function and the comorbidities such as cardiovascular disease and metabolic syndrome, along also with prostatic inflammations. Uh, all this information should be used to suggest to our patients the best tailored treatment to achieve the best quality of life for the patient. Thank you for your attention. Well, thanks a lot for the nice talk. Also emphasizing that there are more factors than just the urological factors that influence um, the, the decision treatment like metabolic syndrome, inflammation, and, and the issue around sex sexuality. Well, thanks a lot for, for giving this talk. And now we have exactly about 10, 12 minutes time for discussion. And I will start off with a, with a question that comes from the floor. Maybe that's something for Matthias. Um, what do you think the role of findings like secondary changes on the bladder, like thickening, diverticular, and trabeculations in response, in prediction of medical management of male LUTs? So how, how, would, you, how would you manage a patient with diverticular, with blood, probably a thick bladder wall? Would you manage these patients differently? Um, maybe you can comment briefly what we what we wrote in the German guidelines and also what is written on the EU guidelines on this topic. Matthias, it's yours. Yeah, that's a, a very interesting question because we assume that the bladder diverticulum or a pseudo diverticulum is a result of bladder outlet obstruction. But when you look in the literature, there is no proof for that. And the same is true for bladder stones. Uh, we don't know if bladder stones are really associated with obstruction. We assume it is, but it can also be the chooser under activity. So therefore, we don't have these parameters as a, as a, as a game changer to decide either if it's a good patient for watchful waiting, for drug therapy, or for a surgery. We assume, and maybe we are right, but there is no scientific proof on that. And I was amazed because I was working this up and I didn't find any. And even, and I can mention this, by the way, we all know that acute urinary tension is, is associated with alcohol consumption, right? When you have a party and drink a lot of alcohol, you have a lot of patients with acute urinary tension. Look in the literature, there is not one evidence and not one line telling you that. So we have a gut feeling and most probably it's right, but there's no scientific evidence. If there's no scientific evidence, we can hardly use it in guidelines because it's an evidence-based uh, book or, or, or article. So I would not change my strategy because somebody has a big, big bladder wall, has a diverticulum. I would assume these are all the same type of patients. However, when it has a huge diverticulum, 
we may have to reject the diverticulum at the beginning. And I've got many patients who have no association with bladder artery obstruction. So the young patients, 30, 35 or 40 with big diverticula without obstruction. Mm. And maybe they were born with this abnormality. I don't know. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Um, there, so there's then, certainly high level evidence missing on this topic. There's no doubt about that. No, there is almost no evidence. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. No okay. scientific okay. evidence. Okay. Well, the next question that came in, maybe it's something for Malte. Um, and when, when you realize the slides, you, analyze, you see that the, the, the data are quite old. And the question are, do you have any information on newer pharmaceuticals that are being developed in the BPH area? Are you aware of any recent developments probably going on in phase one or two studies, Malte? but probably also then to the other two but yeah other i mean of course that that's a brilliant question so so what what we see like even even the the prediction models we have they miss some of the newer medications i mean newer like silodosin or also tadalafil so this is something i think where the question is heading to and if we look at novel targets and novel medications, which are in the pipeline, are not really aware of something also from, from the Congresses where I would say this is something which seems to be around the corner and where we can expect something. But maybe maybe I'm, I'm missing those data, but I'm not really aware of something where we could say there seems to be a game-changing new class of drugs around the corner we may be using in future for our patients. I don't know whether, whether any of the other panelists is aware of that, but I honestly am not really familiar with any of, of uh, kind okay. of newer, Matthias, more promising Matthias developments. Matthias shakes his hands, so he doesn't, he doesn't believe so. No, no, uh, I completely believe so because the, the latest drugs introduced in the main last treatment were uh, Mira Beckram, the beta-3 agonist, and Tadalafil, the PD-5 inhibitor. But then afterwards, nothing happened anymore. Mm. And maybe we don't have more receptors to target. I don't know. But when you look at the congresses, you will find primarily new operation techniques, minimal, minimally invasive operation technique, prosthetic urethral lift, uh, okay. prosthetic embolization, the water vapor. This is currently the focus of the scientific research in BPH, may lots. Okay. Okay. Thanks. A question for a question for Paolo, actually. And and the question is, would you prefer a PDF5 inhibitor in patients with prominent prostatic inflammation and sexual dysfunction? And my question with this respect is maybe I can add a comment. How do you assess prostatic inflammation non-invasively? So the question is how to assess it non-invasively. And do you think a PDF5 inhibitor is a good is a good um, is a good uh, question is a good drug for these patients? Yeah, thank you for this question, which is I think very clinically relevant. Uh, I believe that uh, um, I, I mean data show us that uh, tadalafil also have an important effect on reducing prostate inflammation. Uh, so in patients with prostatic inflammation and sexual dysfunction suffering from LATS, maybe uh, this, treatment will, this treatment will be, uh, will be uh, of course, uh, very useful and very effective. The problem is uh, always to consider uh, the severity of uh, lower urinary tract symptoms, because uh, in some cases, uh, patients suffering from very severe symptoms who are uh, uh, significantly obstructed, probably Tadalafil, Tadalafil alone is not enough. Regarding the second uh, question on, on how to assess prostatic inflammation, uh, this is something really important. Of course, the only, the only way to, 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 assert, to ascertain the prostatic inflammation would be to perform a biopsy, but this is something uh, uh, not at least not always possible in the BPH context. Uh, so normally I would uh, uh, rely on symptoms, uh, so patient's history, 
and also on something that is been controversial in literature, but it is a, a, a an ultrasound science that has been associated with inflammations, which are uh, lithiasis inside the, the, the prostate. Okay. I've got one question, Stefan. Can I ask Paolo? Um, and maybe not, maybe not, because we are fair. Sorry for that. We have a fair amount of questions from the from the audience. So at the end, then maybe. Sorry for that. So this is a question to Malte, and it's coming from Austria. What is the best argument for maintaining medical BPH treatment? considering the increasing armentarium, that's something Matthias always touched, considering the increasing armentarium of minimal invasive options. What would you tell a patient? What is the best argument for continuing um, um, this type of medical treatment? Malte, what would you say your patient? I mean, if, if we look at the data, we can say that, that now we have a huge body of evidence related to, to the response and the effectivity of medical treatment. We also have long-term data and many of the newer minimally invasive technologies really lack the huge body of evidence we have on medical treatment. And in the end, we honestly have to say that uh, lower, I mean, there, there are no studies which are comparing outcomes between medical treatment and minimally invasive therapy. So, we have to be very precautious in suggesting that minimally invasive treatments are really a substitute for medical treatment, especially if we don't know whether further down the road, the patients will relatively soon end up in taking medication again, maybe. So I think this is something where we have to really be honest to our patients, to look into the data and to be skeptical what to offer them and what to promise them. Mm -hmm. Sure, I agree. The long-term issue and the validity of the data is a problem. So we have for medical Absolutely. treatment, we have thousands of patients in randomized trials with long-term yeah. outcome. This is certainly argument that you can use for, yeah. for, 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 for medical treatment. treatment. Okay, okay, great. And thanks. A question for Paolo again, because you briefly touched this issue. Is there, are there any updates on combining alpha blocker and anticholinergic treatments? Is there anything new? Uh, well, I'm not aware of anything new. We know we have on the market uh, some drugs uh, uh, which uh, combine together in one pill uh, alpha blockers and uh, antimuscarinic drugs. Uh, honestly, in my clinical practice, uh, I'm not used to uh, suggest this kind of treatments. Most of the time, I use uh, the the drugs uh, in monotherapy or uh, or two pills. I mean, uh, of course, uh, as I show in my slides, uh, there there is there are some the patients that will benefit from this treatment, but we need to carefully assess uh, not all the symptoms, but also the degree of, of obstruction. Because uh, as uh, as everyone know, we could not suggest antimuscarinic drugs in patients with very high. Um, okay. Postboy residual volume. All right. Okay. So I also am not aware of any very prominent new new publication publications. Maybe I can. The next question is an interesting one. Uh, they are all interesting. Hello. This is a urologist residence from Ethiopia. Though well, that's the good thing. So we have the whole world around here. Uh, we have a lack of most medical drugs except alfuzosine and finasteride. My question is, is it, wait, is, is, it, is it possible to discontinue these drugs? Because in these countries, um, the patients usually have to pay these drugs. And when shall we restart medication or proceed to surgery? And the second question is, how long shall, shall we continue? medical treatment. So maybe I will ask Matthias here. Um, so the question is, is there a chance in countries where patients have to pay them, have to pay the drugs to discontinue the drugs? And when would you say also um, in, in the, in, with respect to these economical issues, when would you stop the treatment? So Matthias, please. Yeah, that's a good question. The, the good news, number one, is you don't have to take tamsulazine and dutasteride. You can do the same treatment with alfuzosine and finasteride. These are the groups of drugs which you need to treat patients with the risk of disease progression. Uh, 
Number one, is this a patient? If this is a patient with disease progression or high chance of disease progression or due to max and all these parameters we have mentioned already, then it's certainly a candidate for combination therapy. And because finasteride or dutasteride work rather slow, you should take it at least six months. And in patients with a, with a good symptom reduction, you can get rid of the alpha blocker afterwards. If this goes good or if this goes well and the patient becomes asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic you can continue until the rest of your life however if he progresses over time then you should consider surgery and when you see the risk of disease progression acute urinary attention and the need of surgery yes it's true that you can significantly reduce these chances however it's not zero uh, even in the worst outcome, there's always a slight chance that you develop retention or you have disease progression, even though you use the combination therapy. Yeah. yeah? So the, the, the risk is not zero. It's decreased, significantly decreased, but it's never zero. And if he worsens then with uh, the five alpha ductus inhibitors, I would consider surgery. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, it's good to have somebody from Africa also online. Uh, yeah. Greetings to there. The next question, maybe to Malte, it's a drug we have not mentioned at all. The question is, does desmopressin still have a place in treating men with substantial nocturia? Of course, I mean, I mean, nocturia is its own topic. And of course, if you see that the patient has nocturnal polyuria, which you can assess by doing the, uh, the miction diary and, and some further tests, then I think it's a very valid and it's the very valid treatment of nocturnal polyuria. I mean, there's no question about that. And their desmopressin has a very prominent role. And uh, I mean, nocturia is one of the most often overlooked, or let's say, Nocturnal polyuria is one of the most often overlooked diagnoses when we are treating nocturia. So this is something uh, we definitely should point out. Yes, it has, has a clear place. No question about that. But this should be a patient uh, with really clear nocturnal polyuria and no congestive heart failure with uh, edema of the legs and a sleep apnea. It should be really an overproduction. Then it's highly effective. Of yeah, course. Yeah. I mean, this is... This is what I pointed out, that you do the voiding diary and also additional tests to, to rule out yeah. that there are any other reasons for nocturnal polyuria. I mean, if yeah. it has to be a true nocturnal polyuria, not related to secondary causes. Yeah, and you, you, worry, you have to be very careful with the drugs to check for cardiovascular problems, to check the sodium regularly. But if you have, if you have such a patient and you, it's not possible to manage his symptoms otherwise, Yes. It is an option, I would say, but I think you have to be very, very careful in, in patient selection and follow up. But, but I, I agree with the guy it's, who said it, it, it's, 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 it still plays a role. So yeah. a question now for, um, yeah, again, I think for Paolo, um, I don't, what is your PVR threshold? It's an interesting question for prescribing antimuscarinics in men. Yeah, basically it's the same as the EAU guidelines suggest, which is 150 ml. So normally, of course, uh, of, uh, in medicine, I, actually, I don't really like uh, threshold because uh, normally why we should consider 148 different than uh, 152, but uh, still it is something that we can keep in mind when prescribing uh, antimuscarinic drugs. So you would you would suggest the 150 mLs, okay? Any any, any other thoughts? I, I realized um, um, PVR on 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 one of on Matthias' slides in MTOPS they used the cut of 40 mL, which I don't think is really clinically relevant. So how would you answer this question? When would you be very careful in giving somebody antimuscarinics regarding post white receiver? Let's say if he is already on an alpha blocker. Yeah. In, in the EU guidelines, it's an evidence-based guideline. So we look into the individual trials and all the Astellas trials with the antimuscarinics with temzolusine has been done with a threshold of 150. And we know it's safe. 
Maybe it's 200, maybe it's 250, but all the studies have been done with 150 threshold. So that is the basis of the EU guidelines. So therefore, if we believe in evidence-based medicine, we have to take 150. Of course, uh, you can you can discuss is, is 155 uh, a different thing than 145. We have to be a little bit flexible, but somebody with 300, I would not treat with anti-muscarinics. But 150, I've got no problem. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can ask here, uh, Matthias, a question. Do you think that Betmega is preferable with this respect? Yeah, because it has no influence on the voiding function. It, it works in the storage phase. Um, there have been one, one, two studies. They're showing a slight increase. But in general, there is no mechanism of action showing that it decreases the tuser contractility because the tuser contractility goes via attitude line and not via beta 3. OK. If somebody okay. has PVR, I, I prescribe me a background. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And um, a question for Malte, because we are just writing a paper on this topic. Having spoken on progressive LUTs despite medication as a possible indication for BPH surgery, what would be the role of alpha blockers and 5 alpha reductase inhibitors in the post surgical patient? <laughs> well, I mean, Totally right. So what, what we see from, from the systematic review we are soon publishing or soon submitting is that there is really an increasing number of patients who are back to medication after BPO surgery. And uh, this depends on the study you're looking at, but it's indeed uh, year after year increasing. And what the studies have shown us is that when we to think about recurring obstruction or persisting obstruction. These are the patients who are primarily back treated with alpha blockers, while we also have patients who have, for example, persisting storage symptoms, but this happens earlier post-operatively. So uh, there are patients who are back on medication, but mostly the, seem, the data seem to suggest that these are patients who have a recurrence of obstruction after a couple of years, if you think about the alpha blocker treatment. But the data which are out there, they are, I mean, they are not really pointing out whether in the post-surgical patient, the medical treatment is as effective as in the pre-surgical treatment. This has not been investigated. So this is something uh, where it seems to be kind of trial and error concept, but, uh, most of the patients who later on underwent, or many of those who later on underwent medical treatment, they ended up in having, or the, it was a risk factor for additional secondary surgery. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, can you just briefly describe on this systematic review which risk factors um, we have identified that patients receive medical treatment after BPH surgery? So, so the risk factors we were able to see, these are mostly the risk factors associated with persisting storage symptoms because mm -hmm. this has been better investigated. And there we can see that older age, so usually older than 70 or 75, depending on the study, and especially um, stronger storage symptoms preoperatively, and also diabetes, for example, which seems also to be associated with uh, neurological aspects these are some of the risk factors which are suggestive of a persisting need for medication post-surgery. And those, for example, who underwent alpha blocker treatment, that's a different story. These are primarily the ones who had the real persisting or recurrent obstruction or okay. let's say recurring adenoma, if you want to simply call it like that. So there we have to differentiate. Okay, great. And we have, I think, three more questions here. There are continuously questions coming in, but I think we have to stop at some time point. And um, one is a question for Paolo. Any role of specific subtype of PDA5 inhibitors? Yes, yeah, so we have data actually not only on, uh, on Tadalafil, we have randomized trials also on Sildenafil and Bartenafil, but I think that uh, uh, the, um, the most effective drugs and the one that is currently only patent for this kind of treatment is Tadalafil because of its mm -hmm. pharmacokinetic profile, which allows the once a day administration, which of course is something essential in this, uh, in this context. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's the only one where we do have where we do have good data. Yeah, I agree. So it's it's tadalafil five milligram. Yeah, perfect. Great. And a question for Matthias. Um, um, what is the preferable alpha blocker as a first line treatment? Do you differentiate alpha blockers? Do you or do you also you always use tamsulosin as a first line? Yeah, if a patient with male nut comes, there's always a reflex to prescribe tamsulosine. It's, it's patent free, it's cheap, it's effective. However, there may be some problems when you have a patient with arterial hypertension. The risk of force and fracture is significantly increased in the first two months of treatment. It's extremely expensive for the community, for the, for the society to, to have it. So never forget to use it in the evening or night in the first two months. And if there's a patient very sensitive, you may want to change to celodosine. Or if he has a problem, you can change to Tadalafil. And in the German reimbursement system is completely paid by health insurances, even Tadalafil, if there's a problem with, uh, with, with tolerability. All right, okay, okay. And do you also and, and, and tailor this depending on, on, on and the risk of retrograde ejaculation? No. You think they all are the same? No, no. A celodosine is a, has a very high risk and tamsulosine is lower, but it's still higher than others. Like doxazosine and terazosine, as Paolo showed, has the lowest risk of, of retrograde or a relative unejaculation. Okay. But this is primarily not the issue in the majority of patients with ejaculation, yeah. at least not in Germany. All right. Maybe it's different in Italy. <laughs> it's okay. certainly different. Uh, all right. Um, so we have one more. I think we finished now. We have one more question coming from Livia. Um, maybe we will ask Malte to answer this. Um, when do we start medical treatment for patients with mild symptoms? Do we really need medical therapy? And what to choose as a first line um, therapy in these patients? Would we choose monotherapy or combination therapy? So the question is really somebody with mild symptoms. I mean, honestly, so if I have someone coming in with mild symptoms, uh, we, ha on, we have to discuss whether the patient really wants to take a medication at all or not. Because... Uh, depending also on his risk of progression, uh, he may not really benefit from starting the medication early. For example, if it's someone who has a relatively small prostate volume, mild symptoms, of course, I would be very reluctant in starting a, a ferf alpha reductase inhibitor. And uh, because we know that also the, the effect of medication won't really kick in in smaller prostates. So this is something where and the first question is, do we indeed really want to treat this patient, yes or no? Because whatever we do has side effects. And it's also the question whether the, the effect of treatment, which also sometimes isn't that strong with medication, really balances the potential risks. But if you think about someone, and if you think about whether to start a monotherapy or a combination therapy, then, of course, this is also related to the potential of progression and it has to clearly to be discussed with the patient. But uh, I mean, the, the benefit of a combination treatment primarily is related to the faster onset of the alpha blocker. And if he has only mild symptoms and isn't really too strongly bothered by it, but has a higher risk of progression and wants to avoid progression, then a monotherapy with a false alpha reductase inhibitor may also be suitable. So this is something where we have to be very precautious in not over-treating someone who doesn't really suffer too strongly from, from his symptoms. My question would be, why does a patient with mild symptoms come to your office? Because I told you that the symptom severity goes along with quality of life decrease. The more symptoms, the more quality of life decrease. Yeah. But if somebody has only little symptoms but have a poor quality of life, there must be something behind is yeah. the fear of prostate cancer, Absolutely. or there is one symptom that is really bothering him, and we have to find out which one it is, and yeah. it's frequently nocturial. Okay, yeah. okay. Maybe, maybe this will 
lead us to now really the last question. Um, and because you mentioned prostate cancer, in a patient with a life expectancy of less than 15 years, well, if you are able to predict this, is measuring PSA necessary in the initial evaluation? Well, I would say no, because you can use prostate volume. So I, I would be very, very reluctant in doing that. But this is, you agree? I agree. Yeah, yeah. I, so, well, I think we had, we got a fair amount of questions. We had a very, very nice discussion. I would like to thank the attendees. I would like to uh, really um, thank the faculty for giving good talks, which obviously stimulated a lot of discussion. And I think I will end up, um, will end up the seminar and I will thank once more ASU, the ASU for organizing this and also the sponsor GSK for making this possible. And I wish everybody, wherever you look from the world, and now at least in the middle of Europe, we have, we have now evening. I would like to everybody now a nice evening and thanks for joining us. And I think it was a, it was a great webinar and it was a pleasure for being with, with you. Thanks a lot and good night. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Take Thank care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.